Hey, it's Bill Simmons. Did you know I've had my podcast for 15 years? Do you know that it is the most downloaded sports podcast of all time? Did you know I have guests from the sports world, from the culture world, people who work for The Ringer, people outside The Ringer, celebrities, experts, you name it. It's on my podcast three times a week, late Sunday night, late Tuesday night, late Thursday night, the Bill Simmons podcast. Check it out on Spotify. This episode is brought to you by Anytime Fitness. We may talk a whole lot about sports, but when it comes to keeping fit ourselves, there's definitely room for improvement. I hit this point early July. I was just like, I am not in good enough shape. I started trying to walk at least 15,000 steps a day or hiking or just anything to keep my legs moving. Now it's the end of 2023. I feel great. I had a physical... Uh, three weeks ago and the guy was like, you're doing great. You're doing better than you were three years ago. I felt great. Whatever your goals are, progress is possible. Thanks to Anytime Fitness. Get a personalized plan and support from an expert coach anytime, anywhere. Visit anytimefitness.com to try Anytime Fitness for free. Start to train for your life. Terms, conditions, and restrictions apply. See website for details. This episode is brought to you by Atlassian. Atlassian software like Jira, Confluence and Trello help power global collaboration for all teams so they can accomplish everything that's impossible alone. Because individually, we're great, but together, we're so much better. Learn how to unleash the potential of your team at Atlassian.com, A-T-L-A-S-S-I-A-N.com, Atlassian. Tap the banner or visit this episode's page to learn more. I need support staff to clear the room. Stand up and walk now. Hello and welcome to The Watch. My name is Chris Ryan. I am an editor at TheRinger.com and joining me on the other line, making beef three ways, it's Andy Greenwald! I really am ready. I mean, I'm ready for the era, and Chris is making a Top Chef reference. Sorry, I I, I always get away from that. But I'm ready for the era for rappers other than Action Bronson to do elaborate food-based metaphors because Beef Three Ways (laughs) is a great mixtape posse cut. I don't know why there isn't isn't a Conway mixtape called Beef Three Ways. (laughs) Probably because he's... Yeah. Um, Andy, special show today. So obviously, as we've alluded to, we'll talk a little bit about the first episode of Top Chef uh, Season 19 set in Houston. I also have an interview in the second half of this show with none other than Nikolai Coster Waldau, who people probably know as Jamie Lannister from Game of Thrones, which was a major subject of this podcast for nigh on six years or seven years or whatever it was. I'll just say that Nikolai has a movie on Netflix this week that's very cool called Against the Ice. That's why I was talking to him. It's a two-hander with him and Joe Cole, uh, who people may know from Peaky Blinders and Gangs of London. And it's basically a, it's a true story set in the early 20th century about Danish explorers who were trying to prove that Greenland was in fact one land mass. Mm. And don't let that scare you because it's basically a frozen tundra adventure. And uh, Nikolai's amazing. And the reason why I wanted to talk to him was I just think that it's been really cool watching him sort of plot his career uh, since Game of Thrones because he's chosen to do a bunch of really interesting small genre pictures like Shot Caller and Small Crimes and A Taste of Hunger and now uh, Against the Ice. And he co-wrote Against the Ice. Hmm. And I just thought he was just an interesting cat. I just really wanted to talk to him. And let me tell you, he's also a beautiful man. Um, so it's just like he's still got that going for him. So uh, stay tuned for the second half of the episode, my, my chat with Nikolai. Was he like, oh my God, talk to Thrones. I love you guys. It? He didn't. He didn't he mention wasn't. that. I, I did I think, see, I wanted to ask him a lot of, you know, one thing that I didn't do, I didn't yeah. do two things. One, I wanted to ask him about his Leeds United fandom. Didn't do that. Oh, I okay. mentioned it at the mm-hmm. beginning before we started the interview and he was just like, yeah. The second thing is, is that he has <laughs> Sounds a, great, by the way. He has a sick welcome to my like home tour on Architectural Digest's YouTube channel. Oh, that's good stuff. And he's just like wearing striped linen pants and no shoes. And he's just like, welcome to my LA home. These are these plates that I got in Lima. You know, like it's it's just like awesome. But when you see, if you ever want to ask, I feel like that would be weird to ask somebody like, oh, I saw the kind of plates you have in your kitchen. Because they, even though they open up their doors to Architectural Digest, I still feel like there's like a a barrier where you're like, don't fucking talk about my plates, man. I'm Jamie Lannister. Cut your hand off. This is fascinating to me because honestly, I think there is nothing more interesting and revealing than a splashy photo set 
of someone's home and in, in you know in most intimate places. I also think there's nothing agree. more psychotic than allowing anyone to do that, and I feel fascinated and mortified at the same time. Like I agree, I, I I would love to see people's homes, and then I would never mention it to them because I can't believe they did that. Like I. I, I would barely let you in my home, and you're you're my best friend. Like it's just I know. bizarre. It what, much if, less if root the, around and and look at your no. ceramics and your textiles. Well, first of all, that's because they're extremely valuable. I went <laughs> I went I went big on ceramic and textiles. You know, like when other people were investing in Gazprom, not me, not me. I believe in ceramic. I just and wish Gazprom. I had the opportunity to do something like that when I was in my early twenties. And I was this just is, like, welcome to, my, welcome to my one bedroom or studio yeah. apartment architectural digest. In the fridge, you'll find one half-eaten box of raspberry mm-hmm. Danish from, from Entenmann's. <laughs> and on the wall, a, a painting I found in, on trash day. <laughs> oh my God, no. Like, here's my Brooklyn apartment circa 2002. Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> if you may notice, this is the New York Times in a blue plastic bag on the floor. That's Mondays. Here's Tuesdays in a plastic bag on the floor. Don't touch the one over there. That's last <laughs> Wednesdays in a plastic bag on the floor. You make it sound like you're Kevin Spacey in seven. <laughs> like, <laughs> I, I mean, wasn't I? <laughs> like, there was just, it was a different time. Chris, what would you, if you were forced to, right, like you, you open your door to your home in Los Angeles and there's a yeah. camera crew and sure. they're like, we're coming in one way or another. Like, what Am is I on your- cops? <laughs> <laughs> right. While your wife is flushing your ceramics and textiles. What, <laughs> that was all what, we had. <laughs> what, would you, what would you show them? Like, what would Phoebe, you be those like? those plates were all we had. <laughs> How could you do that, Phoebe? What, what, is there something that is like, oh, this is an item I'm proud of? Like, you know what I mean? Like, I don't have a... Yeah, I do. Um, I do. Okay. I do. We have a couple of, of artisan crafts that I, yeah. I, I personally think are lovely. Some stained oh. glass. My wife's super into stained glass, so we have like a couple of stained glass ornaments. Really? And, um, you know, it's weird. She has... A very cool couple of um, framed covers of uh, various editions of mm. the Master and Margarita, which I understand might be a little out of fashion right now, but the the Bulgakov novel. But for, for for instance, like I think we have some cool stuff. I'd be like, check this out. We got that at at, at Foils in London. You know, I, I I think I'd be able to put on a little bit of show, and then I'd be like, you know, here are the blackout curtains because the sun is always <laughs> out here. You know. <laughs> Um, should we should we pivot to our our, our subject matter? <laughs> you I mean, want to I, talk about Russian literature, <laughs> Chris? I always want to talk about Russian literature. Are you crazy? Like I I, I would, uh, you know, but does our audience? Uh, okay, so th- I actually have a segue for this. So before we get into All Top right. Chef, I did want to talk to you about a trailer that came out this week for a show called oh, Slow good. Horses yeah. on uh, on Apple TV. This is one of me and Andy's most anticipated shows of the year. It stars Gary Oldman who heads up a department of MI5 called uh, Slough House. It's basically like where they send loser spies to while out the rest of their days. So it's good. a great conceit for a spy show. It's also a, the subject of, it's adapted from a, a series of novels by a really great writer named Mick Herron, who's written uh, a series of of books. It's The show is called Slow Horses, which is a kind of twist on the Slough House name. Uh, it's what they call the spies who are there. And he's written, I think, eight books in this series. The show itself comes from, uh, I believe it's created by or run by Will Smith, who's done work on Veep and a, a bunch of other great stuff. And it looks like it has a really cool combination of um, comedy, espionage, action, drama. It looks dope. Great cast. Chris and Scott Thomas is in it. But it's there's an interesting thing that I want to see how people react to it because okay. first of all, Andy, do you want to just say what you thought of the trailer? I just want to say that I think that we should have a category, and I know that historically we don't do well with having like segments or categories in this podcast. But I feel like there's a certain type of project that is just going to be like the Colonel James category. And you remember mm-hmm. uh, the character in, in Boogie Nights who's just very clear about the things that he likes, which involve you know the proper placement of butter and lollipops. And this is how I feel about the show. This is a Colonel James show. We are going to watch this show. I watched this yeah. trailer and I was like, this is everything I like. It's everything yeah. I like and I can't wait to watch it. And I don't have any nuance. I don't have uh, a take. I don't have like a particular point of view that how it's going to do in the marketplace. I'm just thrilled that it exists. And Oldman looks like he's having a blast. 
So I do have one thing I want to bounce off you about this. Yeah. The novel came out in 2010. And mm-hmm. to give people a sense of, uh, you know, how different the world was, both in terms of, you know, geopolitics, but the way um, the world of espionage was depicted mm-hmm. In, mm-hmm. in media, that's also right before, uh, I, think, I think Homeland came out in 2011, started in 2011. It did. Yeah, first year of Grantland. So that's mm-hmm. like, it's a useful way of thinking about what was... On, at the forefront of people's minds in, the, in terms of those kinds of stories back then. And I would say, at least in my experience from reading Slow Horses, the novel, it covers similar ground, a lot of stuff about terrorism, a lot of stuff about domestic responses to terrorism is in, in the novel. And I think it's going to be in the show. And I just, I, I kind of like saw my life flash before my eyes, thinking about like how much the world's sort of changed since 2011. And in some ways yeah. hasn't, but in, in a lot of ways, like, the kinds of stories that you would, how you would tell stories differently, the amount of technological innovations that have Mm -hmm. taken place, the nuances of how, what we understand about the world stage and and maybe some nuances about how we don't understand the world stage. And, and even in, you know, in the last couple of years, uh, like maybe even the way the chessboard has changed in terms of like who we Mm -hmm. regard as the West's emissaries, which for the sake of storytelling purposes tends to be, you know, we, we, when, we, when we're talking about these kinds of spy shows, there, there mm-hmm. tends to be an antagonist on the other end of the board. And uh, it's just changed so much uh, since this novel was written. I don't know if the show is set in 2010, uh, if they were going to do all the novels as, as seasons of this show. I suppose they could go through the years. The most recent Slow Horses book, I think, came out last year or this year. It's in hardcover, so it's recent. I don't know. I thought it was, I thought it was like an interesting element of adapting the recent... Recent fiction. I, I think it. I think it's potentially fascinating to see what decision they make. I would come down though on the side of, for me, it doesn't matter. And I think it's it can get delicate and it can get a little precious when you are trying to, you know, hit your moment in terms of telling a story that is ripped from the headlines. Shut up, Law and Order. Like, I think you're going to trip yourselves up. The thing that was so appealing to me about this trailer, and I have not read the book, was just. It, it just seemed to swagger off the screen with an understanding of what it is in terms of tone, in terms of world, who these characters are, what their station is, both in relationship to the the larger spy apparatus and also to each other. I was thrilled by that. And I, I don't look to this stuff for, um, for journalism. And one interesting thing for us in terms of um, our spy fandom was, you know, I, I hope many people listening went along with us on the journey to the French show Le Bureau, which is like the greatest spy mm-hmm. show on TV and one of the greatest pieces of spy fiction of this century. Even that, and we watched it late, like we got into it around the time we were potting about it. So last year, a year and a half ago, the show began in 2015. The show was itself late and was always playing catch up in a way that was kind of interesting to world events to the point where by the time the series was wrapping up, Russia be- was becoming a much bigger player. Cyber stuff or cyber as they said, was becoming a much bigger uh, part of it. And then when we spoke to Eric Rashad, the creator, he was like, oh, you know, I really feel like everything I do from now on has to be about China. And he, he is, he operates that way. You know, he's, he is inspired uh, from things that are ripped from the headlines and he, that fuels his drama. But (laughs) newsflash, Eric, you had it right the first time. (laughs) Exactly. Like first draft, sometimes first thought, best thought. Um, But all of this is to say, like, what's compelling to us about spy fiction is the nature of a, of what it means to be a spy and to live a double life and to live in secrecy and to interact with the world on multiple levels at once and what that means for emotional life and drama, right? So I, I, I too am interested in where the story is set, but my hope is that I don't actually, I'm not going to start Googling, you know, MI5, MI6, uh, 2010 to see if like the target. No, I, right. I, I, I wasn't. Yeah, I wasn't really thinking. I, th- I was just thinking about it more in terms of the various iterations of mm-hmm. the way we've kind of like thought about espionage and, and everything else. But there is something in the story itself, which is about a group of disgraced spies being thrust into a case that could bring them salvation or total destruction. That is like just sign me up. That just sounds like a great idea. So I'm really excited to check that out. We can get into the Top Chef. I was just going to ask you one question. Yeah. So right before we we started recording, there was a story on Deadline about Phoebe Waller-Bridge 
Mm-hmm. Uh, getting to uh, basically ramping up production on her new show or her, her first like a, a show I think that will be truly hers in a sense that run wasn't or whatever like you know that 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 is like or her killing f- true follow up yeah. yeah or killing Eve wasn't because she t- turned over killing Eve after the first season um, and that it was you know basically like she'd had this overall deal with Amazon for a couple of years now and very excited any any phoebe waller bridge stuff was would be incredible she had done some uh rewriting work on the james bond movie she's doing uh she's going to be appearing in the next indiana jones film but uh i was curious how does it work when somebody has like an overall uh at amazon like that but are they're working on stuff for amc stuff for hbo they're out there doing rewrite work on mgm movies or whatever you know First of all, I know nothing about the nature of her deal or what she has been working on, the project she has brought in, where they are at in terms of development. Like we could have the, – the, the a deadline story is significant in terms of where a project is or where the studio behind it wants to position it in terms of the marketplace and the larger um, general public. But it often tells you absolutely nothing about timeline. You know, like this week – the trades had the story about our friend of the pod, Sam Esmail, making Metropolis uh, for Apple. Mm-hmm. This is the project that I worked on in fall of 2016. You know, like this is this is not news. I think, you know, he's 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 prepping it. Like this was already all in the works, but now it was ready to be announced because maybe the deals were closed or whatever. They it's also not reflective of, you know, she may have six things stalled at different parts uh, at different places on the course, you know what I mean? Like not ready to be announced, but maybe they're waiting on a director or maybe a a network or not a network, it's all Amazon. But basically we don't know how productive she's been vis-a-vis this deal. But I will say that deals are tricky things because Mm -hmm. it's not unlike, you know, it's not unlike in professional sports where, you know, the most valued years in a way from a management perspective are when people are young and hungry and under rookie deals. And then they are kind of they get a in the giant deals that they then sign afterwards. Some of that you almost have to consider as thank you money for what you did when you were underpaid, right? You become sure. overpaid for it. Um, the Kobe Bryant thank you tour. Exactly. So for Phoebe, the other thing that comes into play is position. So when she was not exclusive to Amazon, she may have sold a show like to HBO or a show somewhere else. And if she those deals predate the overall, they are in a first position or second position, and she can work on them even though. Uh, she is under an overall for everything else going forward from the date of signing it. So, gotcha. and then the third piece is it's a TV deal. So if she wants to go act in a movie or rewrite a movie or write a movie, not relevant. She can go do that and do that work and sell it wherever she wants. So it's risky for, com- not risky for the richest company in the world like Amazon, but it can be risky for some of the smaller networks or streamers to to make mega deals because you can't actually guarantee the return you're getting. And very few of them, dollar for dollar earn out. All of this is to say, I did note that the same thing that you did, which was everybody in the world wants a new Phoebe Waller-Bridge show that she's writing and starring in, you know, that, that, that she's doing the Fleabag treatment on. It's it's legitimately exciting. And it was noteworthy in that deal. They were like, she signed a three-year deal with Amazon in 2019. <laughs> so the timing right. seems so to be- So we're coming up on the end of it. Timing looks good for her. Um, it, yeah. It, it seems smart. But the, the main takeaway, business stuff aside, is- this is great. Let's get a new Phoebe Waller Bridge show, and, and and it's not going to be for people who don't follow the trades the way we do. Um, briefly, it was maybe looking like it was going to be a Mister and Mrs. Smith reimagined. Yeah, that was like Glover. a Donald Glover thing, right? Yeah, yeah. Who also now has a massive overall at Amazon, but it is not going to be that. It's going to be something original to her. Okay, well, let's get into Top Chef. So for this first episode, you know, last season we did recaps of every episode pretty extensively, dedicated our second episode of the Watch per week to it, at least. For this people one, loved I think it. people love that. I think no notes. Uh, I think that for this one, at least we can kind of keep this conversation somewhat brief. I'm so excited to have Top Chef back, as as I'm sure you are. This was a uh, a beef heavy episode, I suppose, as uh, it's it's a Texas set episode. Although they took great pains to talk about like the melting pot that is Houston and how many different mm-hmm. cuisines are in it. But there was, I feel like they prepared steak. There was a lot of steak being prepared in this in this episode, right? A, and a, I don't, great, a great amount of steak, yeah. And I don't actually find steak that interesting to watch. No. N- no, and let alone, <laughs> can you imagine sitting down for a 15, essentially a 15-course beef tasting menu? Yeah. 
That was that's, like when you go through your fourth heavy. tartare, I'm like, wow, you really committed to this. Uh, you know, we talked a lot last season about the 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 beauty of a kinder, gentler top chef and whether or not it removed some of the mm-hmm. inherent drama to the show. And, you know, I noted that for the most part, the chefs got along in this first episode. There was nobody who was like, I'm not here to make friends. They all seem like largely delightful people, at least so far. Some, uh, two people were like, I'm not here to make beef dishes, apparently. That's and right. One of, them went home, <laughs> one of them went home for it. <laughs> uh, I mean, honestly, like, the, if I had a theme of this episode, it would be like human frailty and vulnerability in the uh, endemic or late pandemic era was kind of the 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 main idea of this of this debut episode. Yeah, it was wild to hear a chef be like, "So you know, just between us, just just really on the tail end of a vid infection, and I can't smell or taste anything." Right. That was wild. Um. That was Jackson, and, I believe, right? Yes, uh, who otherwise... It's kind of hard to remember the names for everybody, yeah. Pretty well. And then there was Leah, who was suffering from a bladder infection at a really yes. terrible time and clearly was thrown off of her game as... You know, we're spoiling the show, right? Like people... We've watched the episode, so we're talking Yeah, this will go episode. up after the episode. Okay. Yeah. yeah, so she 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 went home. Um, so... Everyone listening to this podcast knows this, I, I've seen all this, this. I've watched all now 19 seasons of this show. First episodes are always messy, just simply too many people. It is a credit, as it always is, to Magical Elves, the production company, that they can make anything coherent out of this mm-hmm. many new people doing things. Um, that said, I found this to be a pretty dispiriting premiere. Not because mm. of the cast per se, because as I'm saying, as I've been alluding to, like, we don't know personalities yet. Um, you come out of this, you know, like this episode, like you do many seasons, being like, oh, Joe seems interesting and like a fun person to hang around. That guy, that guy, what, Buddha, what's his story? Or Darnell, right. I'd like to hang out with him. Like, okay, so there's some people who clearly have talent. Stephanie doesn't points seem to view. like Asian food. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> there is also, what's amazing is that for many, you know, for like half a decade, uh, the villain was, uh, you know, uh, villain is used very much in quotes, but was just like the kind of broy, doughy, white American chef, hyper dude competitive, yeah, who, would, who, who won yeah. the first seasons. But in the last few years, that person has been kind of set up by the cameras and the editing to be kind of a villain. Uh, there was Gabriel, mm-hmm. uh, not the one who won, Gabe, who didn't win last year, who was kind of set up that way, and he seemed to be ultimately fine, just like a fine person, uh, potentially unlike the season winner. Um, right. The late, late or contemporary period Top Chef villain is the clueless Midwesterner. You know, do you remember the woman last year who was just like, I'm just here to make Spetzel. And I was like, yeah. oh, honey, you picked the wrong room, you know. <laughs> and and this lady was from North Dakota, who's just like. She's from Bismarck, yeah. It just, she was like, they wanted Asian food. So I made steak and potatoes with bok choy that I passive- and forgot passively and aggressively <laughs> forgot. And the best part is Kristen Kish is like, how did you- was the bok choy Asian? And she was like, I kind of spritzed a lime near it, which is like <laughs> the way alcoholics like uh, vermouth in their martinis, you know, just like like That's wave right. the bottle <laughs> to the other end of the room. Um, so, okay, so the, 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 the characters are the characters, but what kind of bummed me out was two things. The, the real strength and joy of the last two seasons you know, and maybe these are cumulative feelings that one acquires after watching so much Top Chef. They weren't necessarily the competition, although both of the last two seasons finished so wildly strong with just fantastic competition. So I don't want to discount that enormous piece of the show, which is a reality competition series. But um, a sense of place and a sense of Mm -hmm. community have become equal partners, I think, in the Top Chef experience. And I felt like both were really, really lacking here. The sense of place surprised me because not only was this the first post-quarantine season of Top Chef, they filmed it in Texas, which from my understanding never had a pre or during quarantine period of COVID. Right. And so I was really surprised that for the first episode, and maybe I'd love to hear about this, maybe they were actually still under kind of bubble protocols and and running a, you know, and they had to be under COVID protocols just as a Hollywood Yeah, I mean, they were wearing their masks and Whole Foods and everything like that. And no one else was. Everyone else was like Ron DeSantis being like, please stop this theater. And they're like, literally, sir, 
This is a theatrical production for television. This guy has COVID. <laughs> this guy has active COVID right now. He cannot smell you coming near. Um, I, the lip service paid to Houston was prevalent. But you and I, you know, the official mascot of this show is not Christine Baranski. It's the Houston episode of Parts Unknown. I mean, we mm-hmm. both are obsessed with Houston's culinary scene and would love to spend time visiting it. I was really shocked that the first episode wasn't a here's why we're here primer. Like we are absolutely yes. going to a place where within steps of each other, you can get the best banh mi of your life and brisket and taco. You know what I mean? Like let's let's show us why we're here and really like get into it. And in fact, it went the opposite direction. It felt bubbly in that the first challenge was another kind of like overly busy, you can't talk to each other, so we can't actually communicate a bit of gamesmanship, and then right. a whole lot of stake. And then the sense of community part for me was that was disappointing was, you know, I loved the judge panel. I loved mm-hmm. having our pals back. I loved what that did for the consistency week to week and the people's ability to watch chefs grow. Clearly, they remember that. I mean, these people are really smart who make this show. They adapt and they pay attention to what works and what doesn't. And so as we learned, someone from the past is going to be back every week. And um, this week, it was one of our favorites, Dawn, although you and I both cringe whenever she says Houston is her city because we know she's from Philly. We know. right? We claim her. We want her as, as one of ours. So that's going to be a part of it. But then when you got to the, the I feel like Houston judgment, and Philadelphia now have a, a much more like, equitable <laughs> yes. talent exchange right now, you know? On the court? You mean? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I was stunned by the level of chefs that were and cooks that were at the table for judgment. Like Chris Shepard was just like hulk lurking in the corner, like the Incredible Hulk, and like he's one of the most prominent and powerful restaurateurs in Houston, and he got like three lines to be like, "That was good," you know? Yeah. I, I just thought that was a, it, there's not there's not enough real estate for all of this, but I it, it felt like a episode of Top Chef from any year in the last decade when I have been so enjoying the show's evolution and reaction to events of the world, both social and cultural, but then also viral in the way that it pivoted and made a great season last year somehow. So I, I was mm-hmm. left feeling as cold as the tartar. Uh, speaking of tartar, a couple of people did distinguish themselves, I thought, in this episode. Yeah. Uh, so... I thought it was noteworthy that when everybody does the introductions and they're like, has anybody here you know, been nominated for a James mm-hmm. Beard Award and worked in Michelin Star Restaurant? And then there's like the one guy who worked at Noma, right? Yeah. Now, all these people have like incredible CVs, so I'm not trying to dis- But I, I, I do think that watching the, like the face of Top Chef change over the last 10 years has been really cool. Or I've been watching it for 10 years, but watching the like the last, you know, however many seasons I've watched in the last couple of years. And there's an obvious like shift in the demographic of of chef and also the kind of food that they're cooking. Mm-hmm. So that was notable. I thought that just like, you know, you've got like one or two fine dining or not even one or two fine dining people, but just like the guy being like, I'm from Noma and it's like, you're the odd one out here. You know, I thought it was interesting. And the, you know, this isn't the edit didn't do this. This is what happened in the episode. The most distinguished, I guess, on paper chef who spent time at Noma totally fucks up the quick fire and yeah. doesn't get food on the plate. And then the and this is just you know back of the and ironically had Don scratching. lecturing him on on time management an incredible moment <laughs> like that was yeah. an incredible flex by Don um, it's it's like it's like James Hardy telling Tyrese Maxey to get sleep you know like sleep it yeah. is the most important thing to do when you're off the court um, the winner who was again the winner this wasn't like they don't Ro- Robert fuck things right? up but yeah. Robert wins and I think just back of the notepad scratching is like Robert seemed like the least credentialed chef like well, his he whole thing was that i'm been a, in a restaurant since 2019 he was a private chef um yeah and moved very slowly in the kitchen and and somehow won for beef that i get i kind of wish they would explain these things a little bit more like the last time we saw his beef he was like kind of poking at it with some sort of <laughs> wire sieve being like this is too tough to be served and then everyone was like this beef was perfect right. how does that happen how does that happen Anybody? So it, I, I, it's hard to like say like this person's food jumped out at me, but I did think Ashley was really interesting. Uh, so Ashley is a chef from Virginia Beach who is trained in French cuisine and Italian cuisine, mm-hmm. but cooks Southern Appalachian cuisine. And she was 
feature like in the photos of her where, where she, when she was introducing herself like she's like working on a farm and is doing a lot of like yep. sourced like locally sourced dishes uh she did a really interesting tartare i thought that seemed to really grab the judge's attention and i just in vibe wise really was into joe uh the, joe has so, the best vibes yeah without question um, so yeah, it'll be you know it's really hard to say like I don't think Robert is in any way like the leader in the clubhouse just because he won one event and I feel bad for the lady who went home who was obviously not feeling well uh, but it seemed yeah, seemed and, almost and, to be like I I volunteer as tribute like I, I I had a bad day and there were other people like like Monique has I've I've heard about her restaurant in San Francisco she seemed really focused and her plating was really good but. There definitely wasn't, and I and I'd like to go back. I kind of wonder if you watch past seasons and first episodes. It's not. It's not. It, it has happened, but I don't think it's happened often that like someone just comes out on the gate on fire and is just so mm-hmm. clearly outclassing everyone else. Um, but I guess I kind of wished someone had because I kind of wanted someone to separate from the pack and be like, oh, we're throwing down a gauntlet that we're going to be able to do this. this you season. can kind of start to just see heavyweights come out. Like Shoda, I thought like. Was yes. was pretty hot out of the gate and and didn't quite lead wire to wire and obviously didn't you know win but like I thought you can sometimes see people kind of distinguish themselves early on. I, um, the, the other thing yeah. that was kind of lacking, other than I think you're right to shout out Ashley, was at least in the early going or at least in the people who got showcased. The thing about Shoda that was so remarkable was Shoda just was literally cooking in a different language than everybody else. Um, mm-hmm. You know, he, he, the, the the techniques that he learned in Japanese kitchens just set him apart. And they didn't necessarily make him better than everyone else, although he's so exceptional, they kind of did. He was just clearly making food with, from a very different approach than other people's, which, you know, there was a very diverse cast last year, but it did, by and large, come from a Western cooking, slicing, and plating perspective. And that was cool to have that other energy in the kitchen. And I would imagine there are people that I'm forgetting or overlooking or didn't get screen time that will bring that this season. But that was something that I was really appreciating about the show in the past. I don't know. I think it's a different energy. You want them to get outside. You want them to go around Houston. You want them to get some fun. You know, like you, I do. You and then like get in the cut. You had all those like heavy hitters at the table. And then the guy who may, who was at judge's table at the end was the guy who hosted them, who may well be an important restaurateur in Houston. And that may be a, a, an essential restaurant. But he didn't feel like a heavyweight to me because mm-hmm. I didn't know him and also because I kind of like, this is weird to say, but at this point in the show's history, the insular nature of it isn't a bad thing. Like I wanted Dawn there. Like yeah. Dawn has been there. Dawn lives in Houston. So Dawn being like, this is why you won, for me would have been better television and maybe even had more credibility because she knows what the show can be capable of. Is Tom still tweeting about crypto? I mean, as you know, that was a trap. As you know, I've not been on Twitter since December. But one of the things that pushed me off, other than other than just general, like people, I'm not an epidemiologist, but here's why you're effed. <laughs> one of the things that got me off of Twitter was Tom being like, wink emoji, wink emoji, here's a burger NFT, get familiar. And I was like, you're better than this, Tom. Tom Colicchio, five hours ago. We're live on Twitter Spaces. Come ask some questions about food, music, Web3, and tonight's Top Chef premiere. So yes, he's still tweeting about crypto. People get brain broken, man, huh? Like, what? what is that? I just, can Wait, you, did, can I eat craft in the metaverse? Like, I don't think so, right? I don't think so. I mean, I, I guess he was kind of at the forefront of just like, the, the chef throwing up your hands and being like Kramer doing the movie phone imitation and saying, why don't you just tell me what you want to eat? Because the innovation <laughs> at Kraft, for people who don't know this, the innovation at his big restaurant Kraft was that the menu is divided between like mains and sides. And you could be like, yes, I, I think that I, a customer who has never sat in a restaurant this fancy before, should be the one to decide what the steak right. goes well with. Like, right. <laughs> power to the people, man. I guess it's all, you know, <laughs> wide open systems. That's what the future. It's blue sky, right? That's what Twitter's getting into. So. That's right. Um, I don't, I don't so why don't it. we we could tap out there? Uh, we'll keep talking about Top Chef throughout this season. I think as the early episodes go on, like it's it's easier to kind of fit them into the, our our Thursday shows rather than dedicating forty five minutes to them. Uh, we'll get into my interview with Nikolai Coster Waldau from uh, the film Against the Ice, as well as obviously Game of Thrones on Monday. We're going to have a special guest, uh, Adam Scott from Severance is joining us. And we'll be talking a little bit about the first few episodes of Severance and, and his career. It's a really cool 
uh, long talk, but we'll we'll also chat maybe a little bit about the dropout and some other stuff. And I think we have another guest on on the following Thursday. So we have like we have a ton of guests right now. Yeah, we do. We're, so we're we're, we're cooking. being very welcoming to people. That's right. We are. Space. It's a big tent. Uh, we were produced by Kaya McMullen as always. Andy, I'll talk to you on Monday. I can't wait. This episode is brought to you by Mint Mobile. New Year's resolutions are fun the first couple of weeks. Then you kind of maybe conveniently forget about them halfway through January. No shame. It happens to us all. But this year, I have a foolproof plan, at least when it comes to saving money. Just switch to Mint Mobile and you're done. Goal accomplished. Because for a limited time, their wireless plans are 15 bucks a month when you buy a three-month plan. The great thing about Mint Mobile is there's no jaw-dropping monthly bills or unexpected overages, and all plans come with unlimited talk and text. Get this new customer offer today at mintmobile.com slash watch. Additional taxes, fees, and restrictions apply. See Mint Mobile for details. This episode is brought to you by State Farm. You might say all kinds of stuff when things go wrong, but these are the words you really need to remember. Like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. They've got options to fit your unique insurance needs, meaning you can talk to your agent to choose the coverage you need, have coverage options to protect the things you value most, file a claim right on the State Farm mobile app, and even reach a real person when you need to talk to someone. Like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. Love the way you look this wedding season at Men's Warehouse. With the range of sizes from extra small to big and tall. Explore top styles at prices for any budget, including designer suit and tux rentals starting at just $159. With over 600 locations, in-store consultations, and easy online booking, there's a reason why couples choose Men's Warehouse to find their perfect fit. Men's Warehouse. Love the way you look. Red Baron's new fully loaded hand-tossed style pizza is so full of topping. Hold on there, partner. That there pizza is big enough for the both of us. With a half pound of toppings and a soft, chewy crust, it sure is. Problem is, though, this town ain't. (gasps) Introducing the Red Baron fully loaded hand-tossed style pizza. Share something awesome. Nikolai, I wanted to start um, obviously talking about Against the Ice, but I've been really like intently following your career. I know most people would say Thrones, but I obviously was a fan of that. But like, I got to see Small Crimes a few years ago um, at South by, and it it really stood out to me. I loved that movie. I felt like you loved that movie and love movies like that. And I was yeah. wondering if in relation to Against the Ice and the stuff you've been doing over the last couple of years, if that was a little bit of a turning point for you of, hey, I'm going to start making like maybe some smaller stuff, but stuff that I feel really personally invested in. And, and if that led to Against the Ice in some ways. Well, I, yes and no. I mean, I've, I've always loved those movies. I yeah. mean, those character-driven uh, dramas, well, comedies, whatever it is. And Game of Thrones is the anomaly. I didn't know it was going to last for 10 years. Yeah. I mean, that was, it was a great, I mean, it was a wonderful gift and I'm, I'm, I'm forever grateful for it, but it, I've, I've been doing those movies always since the beginning of, 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 you know, since I started. And then I've been, you know, doing some big budget Hollywood, you know, movies. I've, I've tried that and it's, it's great. And, and it's, it, but, but, you know, yeah, my, uh, I like acting. I like, I like to <laughs> dive into characters. I like to, to, uh, get to portray people that are resembles people I know, like with, with all the, uh, you know, whatever that includes as a human being. And the fact that we are so full of contradictions that we are not just one thing or two things, but we are many things, right? Yeah. I think that's can be things that are sometimes lost in the big, big budget action movie. For example, it's like, there's just not room for that kind of uh, character you know, to explore characters like that, which I get. And then, you know, you shouldn't because then you would get boring. It would get boring because you want to get to the next car chase. But yeah, so you're right in your observation, but I, I, I for me, it's it's never stopped. Um, I guess this goes back all the way to Wild Side, right? Because that's, you co-wrote that, yeah. right? And yeah. I, I got to see a little bit of, 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 of bits and pieces of that. I couldn't find it like just to, just to like rent and watch, but 
That looked like a really cool movie. It looked like you, you and Mads oh, looked like it was. It was. It was a very. I was young, um, in, in, and and it was me and and my 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 friend Matt Smigels, a Danish actor as well. Uh, there are similarities in some. I mean, to against the ice, and I never thought of it until after. But my character in uh, Wild Side is called Oscar Mickelson. Yeah, and uh, we shot it in Iceland, and it's very much a story about friendship. Against the Ice, we shot in Iceland and in Greenland. My character name is Mickelson, and it's very much a story about companionship and friendship. Uh, so uh, there's a theme there that I apparently like to explore. <laughs> is the writing bug something that you've never kind of gone away from? Have you been kind of working on stuff throughout your career, or is this a particular well, project that you wanted to get your hands dirty with? I mean, I've been, I've been, I've been writing... Uh, since then, I, I, you know, there was a break um, after Wild Side. Uh, we, we had another, me and the director had another project we were working on, and then they, that fell through. And then I just started uh, working a lot as an actor. Mm -hmm. um, so it wasn't until, like, I guess, 10, 12 years ago with me and, and Joe Derrick, my co-writer here, we, we've been friends forever. And he started telling me these stories that he was experiencing. And I, and I know that he can write. I knew he could write. He, he was a musician. He wrote these beautiful lyrics. And I said, all these stories you're telling me, I think there's something there. Maybe we could write together. I didn't know if we could. And then we just started and we've been developing these various stories, a couple of plays and, and movies. And, uh, and now, I mean, this is the first one that we, that has been made, but we have, uh, we have, a. Uh, a lot of stories on the shelves. Uh, so, so to answer your question, I have been writing uh, quite a bit, and I love it. I love it. It, it kind of uh, it's a different way of, of of telling stories, and I, I, you know, obviously I am drawn to. I can see that my my day job affects my writing. Um, yeah. Like with this story, it's the it's the characters, it's the, um, the surprises in characters uh, that I I'm attracted to. I was wondering whether or not like you can even define the different muscle you get to exercise in writing versus performing. And and I, I was curious also, as somebody who writes, like it, it can be very frustrating. It could be very lonely. It can be very yes. like uh, confounding sometimes. Like that if you experienced... For me, I think that in the beginning of... I mean, watching for so many years, uh, Dan Weiss and David Benioff, work on game of thrones and, and that's like looking at them and they're going, I was talking to Joe about it. I'm like, listen, two best, go to work every day with your best friend. And I mean, that sounds like heaven to me. So yeah. that's why, that's why we then started our company two years ago too, because I was like, we, <laughs> I'm going to be inspired by that because it is, I think that is my, my biggest challenge as, as when I'm writing is to the discipline on, on just not, running away from, the, from, from the work. I mean, not, you know, not to find excuses for not doing the work. Uh, it is, it is brutal. Uh, it's great when you have the, the moments of inspiration, but sometimes you have to find that you, it, it's not just going to happen. Um, and then you have someone that is to, to have someone uh, to do it with. It, for me, it just, it, it really helps. So for Against the Ice, which in some ways is this epic, sweeping, very physical movie, but in another way is almost like black box theater because it's it's really you and Joe just kind of in this blank canvas landscape in a lot of ways. Yeah. What were some of the things that you were trying to do? Maybe structurally, maybe... Uh, I'm, I'm very curious about the writing process for, for this in particular because it's at once like an adventure movie, but it's at once a very, very intimate character study. Yeah. I think yes, it is, and uh, and uh, obviously it's, it's based and it's, it's a true story. It, it's based also on this book, Two Against the Ice, that Ina Mikkelsen wrote, and it was it was what I because I love I mean, uh, you know, uh, story the, the the whole all these stories of uh, of explorers, uh, you know, I've I've heard them from from when I was a kid, and I always find it exciting like that whole idea of, of finding unknown land and going to places where no one's been. There's something, you know, very you know interesting about that it's exciting but then there's also a lot of movies like that and it can get you know you can tell the story quickly and then you go well what else is there but what in the what i loved about this book was the way he described the uh, the inner life how it affects the mentally how uh, your brain will 
make up stuff that isn't there. And then because it's because that's all we have, our perception, this is everything is subjective. You know, uh, reality is really just what we what yeah. is constructed in here, right? Like our, the, the two realities you and I have now is so different. You know, we're talking to each other. But I'm in a in a room. There's some people sitting there with computers. I'm like I'm you know, and you're sitting somewhere else. And I mean, it, it's it, we believe that we are in in a community, and we are communicating, and we're in the same world. But still, at the same time, our realities are sure. very different. Anyway, I'm I'm, I'm being very um, theoretical here. But there's something about that I just find interesting, and I love that the way they describe. Uh, he describes in the book uh, how they see things, how even when they know that this is cannot be real, they want to explore it. They want like, like, you know, uh, they see food, like, like the, like the old cartoon story, yeah. like they see the food, they, uh, uh, you know, Ivor uh, sees his grandfather. And then, and, and in, in the, in the story, we have that in the, in the film, but, but in the real story, they spend days looking for him, even though they knew he wasn't there because there was no way he could be there. <laughs> and then of course there's this little, uh, part of the book which talks about this postcard and and the way he described that uh, was very moving and I thought it was interesting that that they find a postcard with these women on you know just all these women lined up in front of a house and the, they pick Ivor picks three and and Ina picks one to be their girlfriends and then these girlfriends become very real especially for Mickelson so the fact that like we found these these uh, these recordings of the guys when they were old, uh, and it's 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 moving here. Like I think Mickelson was eighty nine, and Ivor was eighty five at the time. And they're talking about this, and you remember, oh, you remember when you know when we saw your grandfather? Oh, we were so silly. We were like losing <laughs> our minds. So funny. And then we did this, and then we did that, and you found that postcard. And we had the girlfriends, and then suddenly Mickelson gets serious and he goes. And that was the time you let me down. <laughs> that was the one time when my friend let me down. And the fact that the, the, the reality is that these were imaginary women. And I ever just made a comment saying, yeah, I had a dream about your girlfriend. I'm sorry. Clearly, it, <laughs> this is, it wasn't real. But 40 years after, the 50 years, sorry, after the fact, the emotional response was still so so strong that Mickelson still had to say, you let me down. Yeah. There's, he's still holding on to it. Yeah. Still, it's still raw. And I thought that was, that was just a beautiful thing. And, and I thought that was interesting to write about. Um, and then the fact that with most explorers, uh, you don't just go out there, you choose. These, these are people that are driven. They want to go and conquer the world. They're alpha males. They, they have something to prove and in this particular story, yeah, we have one of them who is all that. The other guy is nothing like that. He just he just happened to be there. And then he has like so much admiration for for the other guy that when 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 the captain Mickelson asks for a volunteer, he just goes, oh, all right. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm a mechanic. And yeah. I, I, there's nothing. I, I'm, it's kind of boring being here stuck in the ice. So I'll, I'll do that because he has complete trust and faith in this guy's abilities and the fact that you have two so different characters you know as you say it's almost like a, a little chamber piece caught up in this epic landscape i thought was um, was really interesting and the fact that our story has has like like the tension of the first half is about this crazy survival and the second half is also about survival but it's it's maybe in in, in many ways more of a of a mental yeah. Uh, I thought that was interesting. At least that was the ambition we had. I thought it was structurally really interesting that way. You know what I mean? Because I think that there are points you're sort of trained watching survival movies or against nature movies. And you're like, yeah. this is the part when they do this. And this is the part when they get rescued. Or this is the part when they think they're not going to get rescued. Yeah, and then yeah. it just becomes a much more of a psychological battle. I wanted to ask you a little bit about the Mickelson character because, you know, you've um, you've played great characters you've, you've, you've done Macbeth you've played you know sort of like there there are characters that are larger than life and then you're you know you're writing you're bringing this character to life and I obviously saw shades of like you know Captain Ahab-esque behavior in, you know, occasionally in oh. Mickelson I was curious about juggling you know you have these recordings you have this book you have like the real person and then you have 
sort of obviously the dramatic impulse and the desire to create like an interesting character and and yeah. playing with archetypes like that because he's not all Ahab, you know, he's not he doesn't lose it out there and you know in in a way that like where it's far beyond driven, but he's he is driven by something greater than purely survival. I mean, he wants to get these journals. He wants people to know the truth about about Greenland. So if I was curious about the 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 sort of the the real man versus the character that we see on screen and how you how you thought about that. Well, well, uh, what we found out when I when we I was starting doing research was that right after the trip, he wrote one book, mm-hmm. and in that book, he doesn't mention Ivor that much. It's mm. really his accomplishment. The second book, Two Against the Ice, is dedicated to Ivor, and he clearly states that the reason I'm alive is because of this man. I right. owe him everything. And I thought that was interesting. We want to have that into our story. So in our story, we also make him older. And the reality, he was 29 when he did this. In our story, he's, he's my age. And so there is that age gap between the two characters. We have uh, his second in command at one point said, early on says, what are you doing? What are you, you don't have anything to prove. Like you, you, you're an old man. You're getting old. You're too old. And he's like, what are you, t- what are you talking about? Like, this is insane. So he has the arrogance and the, the self-belief and, the, and, and, and all that stuff, and all the, the things that like a guy who has something to prove, right? And driven by, by honor and, you know, all those, those things. Then he has, of course, he has a journey. He has to learn something. And, and, and it's, it's these very basic human things is that we are only something because of the people we surround ourselves with, mm-hmm. people we get into contact with, for better or for worse. That's what defines us. We are not, we're nothing on our own. Uh, he believes that, you know, the, the expeditions Mickelson had done before this were all solo. He was a guy who was like, you know, I know best. I don't need anyone else. But he finds out the hard way that you do. And I thought, you know, wanting to do that, that is kind of a whole life of him. Like we wanted to, uh, you know, to get into this story like that, that, that would which in reality took him probably 20 years to come to that conclusion. We wanted to do that in, in this, this, this story, but you're right. It's a, it's a, it's a, he was a real guy. He he's loved by his, his family. He's a hero in the family. We were very uh, conscious of, of that responsibility. Um, and I knew that of course we are, he, uh, well, this is kind of spoiled, but he, um, he loses his mind a little bit in this yeah. movie. I mean, uh, there you could, yeah, you know, and 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 of course that is something that we, you know, make up based on on the book. But he doesn't go into these details. He's just saying we knew we were losing our minds, but we had to, you know. He's trying to be um, what do you call it, sensible about it. He sure. doesn't go into it. He, when he writes. It's not an emotional thing. He says uh, the most he can say. Yes, we came back and noticed that there had been someone here to, to come rescue us and we missed them. That was a tough day. <laughs> <laughs> it's a so, stiff so, upper lip. That's pretty good. That, <laughs> but then I went up. So anyway, so we, we had a screening for the family and for, uh, we, I spent a lot of time talking to his great granddaughter, um, great, great granddaughter. Her name is Naya Mickelson uh, after Naya. In yeah. The movie. And I, I mean, they were so happy. They were so proud of the movie. They were so, I mean, I was so relieved. Uh, they felt that we honored their relative in a, in a good way. Um, and they felt that all the stuff that we did, even when we, when we showed him in a not, you know, not the best of lights, they got it. They understood it. And then they, the respect. So, so that was, uh, that was a relief, but, but uh, we, we also did uh, think a lot about it wanted it to be truthful, didn't want to make it. I mean, you could have made this, you could have based, you could have done a lot with this story. You could have, uh, you know, gone complete horror, uh, terror, yeah. thriller, you know, the cannibalism, you know, you could have gone that way, <laughs> but we still, we just felt there was so much humanity in it that, that for us was more interesting, like that, the, the emotional impact of this thing between these two men, um, the, the pain of longing, the pain of loss, uh, that idea that if you're, when you, we all know that if we're away from home, if we have families, you can miss someone to then know that maybe everyone back home believes I no longer exist. Right. How does that affect you? 
But that that I you know that all these things we we wanted to explore, and I think that that you know, and and I'm I'm really happy with the way it uh, turned out. You know, you, you uh, and I don't want to keep it too long, but I one of the things that's sort of been a hallmark of the last 10, 12 years or so of of, of your work, and you know, I I was thinking about Shot Caller, and uh, you know, the, some of the more recent films you've done is is like you really seem to gravitate towards characters placed in moments of extre- of extremity. You know, uh, even Taste yeah. of Hunger. You know, I think that being a chef in and of itself is kind of like that a is, very extreme profession. You know, you know, how hard is it? Or maybe now that you're older, it's easier. This, but to, how hard is it to shake these roles after you're done? Um, yes. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, it's it's um, it is it it usually it's not. I mean, I, I smell. I think about it all the time. It's it's on my mind all the time. Um, I mean, you, you, next my next movie that comes out, I think, is called uh, "God Is a Bullet." I did with Nick Cassavetes. When we talk about that, I, I, that, that <laughs> I have some stories to tell. <laughs> but, but usually, it's not a, it's not hard at all. Um, it's it, 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 no, it's not hard at all. It's you know, I, I think I'm I can still I have my sanity. I can still uh, you know uh, see um, it's, it's a job. And there, there's there's a lot of things that go into it, but it is it is a job that I'm able to uh, to let go of. I think. <laughs> Do you think that having more responsibilities in different parts of of against the ice allowed you to kind of compartmentalize that way? Because you know you're yeah, also. Yeah, I, mean, I, 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 I yes, I mean I think that that I've always had that interest, um, even when I'm not producing as here or mm-hmm. right. That I've always had that interest in in the actual construction of the story um that i'm i'm part of it and we're telling a story together we all have our parts to play i've never ever felt that, that i was like a like an isolated part of it that that i didn't care about the rest so i think that's also why i i'm, I'm doing it now why i'm writing and i'm producing because i have i've always had that interest um so no i mean i mean i don't know i mean i i you know it's a difficult thing to i mean i think if you ask my my wife she'll tell you that no he he, he stays in character all the time. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, Nikolai, thanks so much for joining me. Thank you so much, man. Take care. Take care, you too. <laughs> <laughs>